Welcome, everyone. I'm Sandra Bargeman. A few years ago, I wrote and performed a solo show called The Edge of Every Day, which was an exploration of the rough edges and contradictions we all face and grapple with. The show hit a nerve, and the relevance of the topic would only grow over time more than I could have foreseen. So, here we are. Real talk with real people, sharing stories and perspectives that spark provocative invitations to leap out of what's safe. On the edge of every day. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. We are live in the hive tonight. Thank you for joining me on this, the eighth episode of The Edge of Every Day here on talkradio.nyc. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, and for those of you who don't know me yet, I encourage you to check out my bio on talkradio.nyc, or of course you can visit my website, sandrabargeman.com, or you can tune in to any of my previous episodes. In a nutshell, this show is about celebrating triumphs, pushing boundaries, and exploring rough edges. Through conversations and shared stories with friends and colleagues, it's my hope that we can begin to understand our edges. And what I mean by edges is those places where we are fearful, those places where we are resistant to change, those places where paradoxes and contradictions live in our beliefs and our understandings, both internally and collectively in the world around us. Listen, we live in edgy, challenging times, but life isn't black or white, it's gray. It's an embrace of both. And the more we recognize our own edges and get real about them, the more we can help others to do the same. And that, I fully believe, can help to change the world. So, thanks for tuning in. And without further ado, it's time to introduce our guest this evening. Everett Quinton is an actor, director, and playwright, and was a longtime member of Charles Ludlum's Ridiculous Theatrical Company, where he was an actor, director, and costume designer. And from 1987 to 1997, served as the artistic director. While there, he appeared in over 75 productions, including Camille, Bluebeard, Exquisite Torture, Turds in Hell, Conquest of the Universe, Utopia Inc., The Bells, Movie Land, Galas, A Tale of Two Cities, Obie Award, and The Mystery of Irma Vep, Obie and Drama Desk Awards, just to name a few. Most recently, he starred off-Broadway in the hit Drop Dead Perfect, produced by the Penguin Rep and directed by Joe Brancato and in Antony and Cleopatra at the McCarter Theatre Center. Everett recently directed the beautiful revival of Charles Ludlum's The Mystery of Irma Vep at Red Bull Theatre. Other credits include Twelfth Night at the Arizona Theatre Company, Shakespeare in Hollywood, Helen Hayes Award at the Arena in DC, Women Beware Women Callaway Award, and The Witch of Edmonton at Red Bull Theatre. Tennessee Williams, now the Cats with Jeweled Claws at the Williams Festival in Provincetown and as part of La Mama's 50th anniversary season. George Osterman's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Brother Trucker's Bessie Award and Richard and Michael Simon's Murder at Mincing Manor Drama League Award, again, to name a few. Ever to starred in his own one-person show, Bitch Slapped by God, at London's Drill Hall. Film and TV credits include The Louise Log, Nurse Jackie, Louie, Natural Born Killers, Deadly Illusion, Miami Vice, and Law and Order. In 2011, Everett received the Off-Broadway Alliance Award, Legend of Off-Broadway. Welcome, Everett. Oh, hello. No, hello, hello. Hey, my darling daughter. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great, great, great to have you. Thank you so much oh, for being on. I like having oh, friends in high places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's dive in. 
I want to talk about, of course, how I'm starting all of my podcasts, how we know each other. And we met, I had the great, great good fortune to be on stage with you in the Madison Square Garden national tour of Cinderella, starring the one and only Eartha Kitt and you as the glorious evil stepmother. Yes, 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 yes. And of course, I was, I was, you were my mama. I was a glorious, I was the tall evil stepsister. But you knocked him dead every night, though. Oh, my God. Uh, I, what a fun we had with that. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, tell me, how was that experience for you? I mean, I remember talking to you about it now, but share it with our, our it audience. Great. It, it's the only tour I ever did. It's the only national tour I ever did. And I, I got lucky and got in and uh, I had to wait. I waited like a couple of months before they told me I had it because they were star searching and they needed a star. And Hello, star, you. No, but if a star wanted the role, if a big name star yes. wanted the role, I wouldn't have gotten it. And then they got their second star and then I got the role. Oh, and I was like really happy. I was like really happy. Well, you were just phenomenal. Talk well, about rave fun. reviews. I was phenomenal. born evil. I was born evil. <laughs> it's, it was so, it was so much fun playing sour and evil. Um, I, so I well, I have a couple of wonderful fun memories of you. Um, one of them is is a kind one. You were so incredibly. I came in for our listeners. I came. I didn't start with the, with it. I came in on the second leg. And so I, I was worked into what had and added to what was already created. And so to be in the scene with you, Everett and Natasha, um, and to, I, it, it was just freaking hilarious. But, you know, I had to bring my own sort of chops and things in. And one of the things I brought was this ridiculous bird call slash crazy ape that somehow got worked in. And I don't even remember how it got worked in, but it was worked in. And every single night I got this huge round of applause and the next line was yours. And you were so kind. You never stepped on that. You just let it happen. And I was blown away by that. I don't know if I ever told you that. I don't know. Did I, did I, why, I will go back to um, Shakespeare in Hollywood. And uh, it's, you learn from that. And uh, oh, who's mate Lacey? Um, Maggie Lacey w was right on before me in that. And she got a huge laugh the first night I stepped on it because I wasn't, it was our first night out and I didn't know what's expected it, but I never stepped on it again. I, no, 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 no. Oh, it was more. We got a sign, baby. We oh, all... just your generosity of spirit shines through in your talent and your friendship. No, and baby, what, what, what goes what goes around comes around, and that's Ain't a that natural the truth, fact. baby. Um, <laughs> but no, my no. other, oh my, I was just going to say my other one was did you chewing this. Well, of course you chew the scenery every night, but this one night, oh my God, we all did. The whole family chewed the scenery. That's what I loved about it. But this one night, the we were we had finished the scene. We were in front of the house, and it didn't go out. And, and the inside of the house didn't roll on. And it was me and you and Natasha and Brooks. And I, the mortification on our faces and you went off. You took over and chewed up the scenery and we were all peeing ourselves and, and, and mortified at the same time because you were so brilliant. You just saved the scene. You made up the scene that, that moved us along. Remember one time the furniture fell off the 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 pallet as it came in, <laughs> and the chair fell off, and uh, and I couldn't make you two do it because you were the princesses, and Cinderella, Jamie Siegler was over on the other side, and I said, "Look what you made me do, Cinderella!" And come over here and help me, and we got the thing back on, and I said, "I'm gonna beat you to an inch of your life," and Andre, who was holding the bird. Said he had to turn around because he started cracking up. <laughs> oh, no. There were many moments like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, well, that's the advantages of getting older. You, yeah, you're truly. Less you're afraid of things. Ain't that the truth? Uh -huh. well, so let's 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 move to your 
your childhood. Oh, no, um, God. The, the, well, <laughs> where the evilness began. Um, how was your childhood? Did you always know that you wanted to be an actor? Did your family go to theater? What was it like? No, we didn't go to my parent. My wait a minute, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a picture of my mother and father. Wait. Okay. Minute. Good. 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 How much do we love this? I'm not gonna break into song. I promise. I forgot to get this. This explains. Look at how pretty they were. Oh my! I this love explains. Her. Yeah, yeah. She was very beautiful and he was very handsome, but they were like oil and water and they should not have been married. And they were, and now I love my brothers and sisters, but I, but no, no, we didn't, we never had anything. So we didn't go to theater. We didn't. But you, didn't, you, you went to movies and, and did you know you wanted to be an actor? I didn't. I thought I was nuts. Oh. I did not know that. Are they the, the same? What, the way I was carrying on was like one time I did this dance in the deli and I was like, after was so ashamed of myself and I didn't realize till later that it was aspiration. And, yeah. oh. and there was no, and when, did, you know, when did you realize that it was aspiration? Not till I was older. Not when, what, you know, when I, when I got into the ridiculous and started getting rid of all the nuts, when I realized, when I found my way to the ridiculous, Mm -hmm. That's when I realized I had aspirations uh -huh. and that I was, I, I just thought I was this bizarre queer who, I, you know, even though I had seen other queers, you, there's a tendency to think you're the only queer in the world and that you're, you're a target. And so you become kind of guarded and stuff. So I was very unhappy. And then I got into the ridiculous, but you know, but my mother, like my parents were boobs and my mother used to say, oh, we should get that voice trained. And there was no, they no one knew how to do that. No one knew how to do it. It would be a good idea to do it. They heard that voice training existed, but they didn't know how. And they associated it with you, of course. Well, I used to sing in the church choir, except I got thrown out on Christmas Eve because me and Freddie Signiano had a fight. Well, we'll talk about that later, how you're making up for that. <laughs> no, but my Freddie Signiano said my mother and father were home having sex in the bathtub, and I punched him, <laughs> and we got thrown out of the corner. <laughs> uh, well, they, 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 I could see them having sex Troublemaker in the bathtub. and non-singer. I could see them having sex in the bathtub. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I didn't oh have the idea that your parents had sex. I mean, I was in the eighth grade. Oh my seventh. god! I was in the seventh grade. It's like so. So your whole family life, your brothers and sisters, did they all? Was it? Were they supportive? Your brothers and sisters supportive of this creative See, like no, madness no. and this great juice? No, we lived in such madness mm. that there was no cleaving unto each other. We were not, like I have friends who say, oh, we're having a family reunion and 10,000 people. And we go, oh God, just think 10,000 of us. No, no, today we're very happy together, my brothers and sisters, and we're loving and tight. But and there, it was so not- beautiful. There, there was nothing there to um, cling to. We yeah. were all running in our, we were all running for our lives. I spent the first half of my life literally running for my emotional life. Okay, so then this brings you to, uh, okay, we, I'm just getting our two minute break. Uh -huh. um, so we're going to talk about when we come back, getting to New York City and getting into the ridiculous. And when we come back with Everett Quinton, that's what we'll be talking about. Stay tuned. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy, and I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? 
I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Chipping around, kick my brain to the ground. These are the days it never rains. And we are back with our guest, Everett Quinton, on the edge of every day. So let's let's get into the ridiculous theatrical. So it was founded in 1967 by Charles Ludlam, and it was based on the genre theater of the ridiculous. And I'm just going to read for those who are listening in that don't know about the genre. I'm going to read a quick little thing, and then I'll ask you to give all of your depth and nuance to the understanding. Um, Theater of the Ridiculous was a distinctly 60s phenomenon that emerged in America just as conservative 50s attitudes were fading. The counterculture was brewing and anti-Vietnam sentiment was rising. The genre arose in what was then New York's gritty downtown lofts, off-off-Broadway theaters and unconventional performance spaces. By queering experimental theater and introducing non-actors, drag queens, and fantastical stage constructions and costumes to its productions, Theater of the Ridiculous was a rebellion against the popularity of naturalistic or realistic theater from decades prior. So, of course, I, I'm going to ask you to talk about um, the nuances again and the depth around the whole genre and the style of the ridiculous. But before we dive into that, can, can, can I ask you about Charles, meeting Charles? How did you meet him? And did you know, I mean, Lud, Ludmania had happened already, yes? It was already going. And when you, uh, just starting, yeah. And, um, and then you met him. And did you know of the ridiculous theatrical company? Nothing. So tell us about that story. I, well, like I said, I was a young little queer who f- I came to, I found Manhattan. I found the village in 73. Mm. And, and I just started hanging out in the village. And then I, I remember, um, like I, I would hang out and I would close the bars on Christopher street. And then I would end up hanging out on, the steps of St. Veronica's church after the bars closed. And it turns out, um, oh, um, sweet William was part of that crowd. And Jackie Curtis was part of this crowd. And I didn't know them. All I knew them were these people. I didn't know I was hanging out with ridiculous luminaries. I just, we were just people hanging out on the street. Right. And then in, in 75, I was walking, I was I stayed out in the barn. I was cruising Christopher Street. It was February night. It was freezing cold. And I was standing on the doorway. And Harry Katukas, the great H.M. Katukas, used I before I met him, I had seen him. And he and then when I met him, he called me the doorway Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> and and standing in that doorway on Christopher Street next to the it was then the Theater de Lise. I was standing there and I I wanted to hook up, I guess. And then 
I saw this guy walking and I didn't, he walked and I didn't pay attention. And I was just walking up straight and then I turned and he was there. Charles was standing next to me. And then we went back to his house, which is this house. And we did the nasty for the first time. And, but in, in that time, I mean, I didn't know that I had met this luminary and, 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 but when we were walking here, he told me he was writing a gay hero. And he was writing a play called Caprice, and it was about a gay hero. And at the time, I didn't understand hero in the sense of the journey of the play. I, but I did need to hear that there were gay heroes, though. Yes, indeed. I come from, I'm like the last generation of the self-hating homo. And so anything to pull me out of that. And, and then I lost his phone number. And then I, I, I thought his name was Stephen for some reason. And then I, I, I you know, you, it, I lost the number, so I lost the contact. And then one day I was walking down Christopher Street, and this was in July, and there was a restaurant across from Ties, and I think it was the Italian or Duff's, I think it was, mm. and it had an outdoor, uh, a closed-in thing, and he came out and said those these words, the word you do exist. And then we stayed together from that point. And, oh. and it was, and I then, and it was at that point, I would walk down the street and then I realized I had met someone of uh, stature. Notoriety. We yeah. all have stature, everyone has stature, but he had some- Notoriety, you know, yeah. Bittercred notoriety. Yeah. And then I went and I was in school. I was, I was failing. For what? I was in college, but it was not for me. And I, I yeah. was in the wrong place. And then he was doing Caprice, but they had lost the space. They used to be at the Evergreen Theater on 11th Street and they lost that space. So they were gypsies and they hadn't found a place to do a play. So the rehearsal period became very long just because they needed to keep busy. And then finally it was getting up. And, and so I went, they were rehearsing at the Evergreen Caprice. They were about to lose the, the, the people of the Baha'i faith bought the building and the company was way in debt to in back rent. And right. the Baha'i people said, look, if you, when we ask you to move, if you move with no fuss, we'll forgive all the debt. So you can't argue that. And so gratefully Charles said that. And so um, I went, and then, then I got invited to go to the rehearsal of Caprice and I walked in and the first thing I ever saw the uh, Zuni Feinschmecker played by Black Eyed Susan has this speech, which is just, I think it's out of, um, it, it's out of like, the Marquis de Sade or something. It's just filth laced. And it, and <laughs> the first thing I, and he embuggered a goat. Back. Exactly. And I was like, Holy and then shit. the company, was, and it was just a filth, one, and, and it's an amazing speech. And it stops to show all the time, it was an amazing, amazing speech. And then at the same theater, they were doing a fundraiser called Taboo Tableaus. Mm. And they did it, that by now the company was in existence for about 10 years. So they were doing a scene from each of the productions. Yeah. And so I kind of got a, crash course in what the ridiculous was. And I met um, dear George Osterman that afternoon and he was a pretty boy and, and we were about the same age, although he got to the city and into the theater well before I did. He came here younger than I did. And then that night we got came for the show and I met George as Bunny Beswick. And he was like, the he was the tart in hot eyes. And um, and it was so astounding to me. And because, you know, I knew I was a little drag queen all my life, but it was a dirty little secret. Right. And I didn't realize it, what a significant part of my being it was. I, at the time, I thought I was just this sick queer. Oh. And that I had no one to tell me otherwise. And then, the last scene of the, the benefit 
was the death scene from Camille. And I went into the dressing room and Charles was dressing up to be Marguerite Gautier. And he had these beautiful big blue eyes and he did that and he was putting his eyelashes on and he was transforming. And suddenly I realized, oh wait, there is a place for me. And I don't think, um, it, I mean, I am nuts and I probably am gonna die nuts, but that it's a different kind of nuts. It's a, a you know, pure nuts that I have today. But then it was corrupted with self-hatred and stuff. And so finally there was a place for me. Yes. And then I was writing this. And again, I'd seen these rehearsals for thousands of times because there was, and finally it was gonna be done at the performing garage. So I went to the performing garage. I helped out where I could, but then I had to write a paper for school and I didn't want to be intrusive. So I went up into the rafters of the performing garage while they were rehearsing us. I had seen it a million times and I had to write this paper. And I'm sitting up on the stairs and it was freezing. It was February course, yeah. and there was no heat in that room. And then Charles came up to me and said, I just wrote a part and there's nobody to do it. Everyone else is doubling and we're going on tomorrow night. Do you want to do it? And I, I was so nervous because I had, again, I had no belief in myself. I had no, and um, I went on the next night with no, oh just very Lord. little rehearsal, just into the, and it was the Trocadero Gluxinia Ballet because in the play, um, Adrian Caprice's lover and uh, his, his Twifford Adam and his rival is trying to make, Capri's jealous. So he he tricks Adrian into going to the ballet. And then, so I played Flossie Flanagan and I was the ballerina. Of in, course. Uh, and, and Larry Ray, who was the, the artistic director of the Trocadero Glogzinia, he was Ekaterina Sobechinskaya. All the people took like Russian names. <laughs> and I had a mustache at the time. And, um, and then some, Charles said, you'll have to shave that mustache. And I said, okay. And I ran to shave it. And apparently Larry Ray said, oh, he's going to go far. He's willing. And I went, oh, look at that. Right? And, and, and then I was in like a Sylphie thing and I had this horrible wig. They found me this red wig. It had a big ball patch in the front. <laughs> but I went on and, I, start. and I got my first laugh. I got my first big laugh and I was hooked. And I would go on as the ballerina and then Caprice would pull me off the stage and he would come on and finish the dance. And I would run by and my, he'd grab me by that arm and pull me off. And then I would come on all bound and gagged. And it was, that was my first moment in, uh, on stage. Wow. Well, yeah. we have two minutes to break, but I really I, I want to make this point about the, the, the understanding of just quickly some nuances of, I remember when we were talking, you said it wasn't gay theater. And, and, and so much of what I read said it was that. And I so loved your nuanced description of what this kind of acting and what this genre it, was. It, it, Charles objected to the term gay theater. He said no. he did not want to do to theater what people do to people. Yes. But Indeed. what the ridiculous is, is the first honest gay voice. It's not necessarily gay. It, because if it's gay theater, what are all the heterosexual yes. actors in the company? What is what is their work? Right. We're, we're, totally. all, it's, we're all people. And, and gay um, voice. It's the first honest gay voice. It's the first. Love Charles that. always said, if the queer is going to kill himself, he should have a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a great space to take a break. And when we come back, we will continue with Everett Quinton on the edge of every day. Stay tuned. Franklin McElroy, host of the new podcast, Gateway to the Smokies. It airs on talkradio.nyc every Tuesday night from 6 p.m. to 7. Every episode is dedicated to memorable experiences in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and surrounding areas. This show features experts and locals who will expound upon the richness of culture, history, and adventure that awaits you in the Smokies. Tune in every Tuesday from 6 p.m. to 7 on talkradio.nyc. Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? 
Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauber, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Chipping around, kick my brain to the ground. These are the days it never Every moment. And we are back with Everett Quinton. Every moment on the edge of every moment of every day, of every life. Uh, okay, so <laughs> so you, boom, you're on, you're a part, you're a member of this, you're, you're doing your shows, you're learning your craft. Um, and for the sake of all the th- that I want to talk about in, in the next section, I want to I'm going to jump ahead to uh, the mystery of Irma Vep. You would say that that pretty much puts you guys on a serious on the serious map. It, it it's not really. It, it was Charles's most accessible play. Yes. And it, but it's certainly, and, and that so, makes sense. Most accessible. And of course, sad, sad, but realistically, that's often the case. The thing that the most people can wrap their brains around is the thing. But, that's like, but for years, I thought, what does this have to do with our mandate? And then my friend Daphne Gross, who was, our, our, uh, she did everything at the theater. She was uh, everything. If you needed something done, Daphne would do it. Although she couldn't be the dresser in the play. She was, my sister Mary was running the sound and Daphne was supposed to be the dresser. Oh. And Daphne said, I can't do this, I can't do this. So they switched and my sister Mary came back and did the, the play. But one day we were eating and she said, I can't tell if the Irma Vep is the best play ever written or the worst piece of shit ever perpetrated on a public. <laughs> and I, I thought, and I for years wondered why it was, um, uh, part of our mandate. And then I realized that the entire play is abstract. It's an abstractive, it's an abstract expressionist work of art. And when I, when that dawned on me, yeah. it, it suddenly it, it moved it into another place for me. So it is in its, yeah. but it, it's, but like we got so much accolades because, but it's like, you know, the song YMCA, remember, remember Patrick Wetzel, we were at Disneyland and the song came on and we go, why MCA and all these older people and Patrick turned around and said, it gets them all the time ever. And yeah. it, but it's, it's like, exactly. But the mystery of Roma Vep is just like that too. But Charles always said that cliche is the armature of the absolute. <laughs> and what he did was he strung together all these cliches. And so you get it, but the play is so nonlinear that it, it, it's so, when I realized that, I thought suddenly all the questions, you didn't have to, you have to answer actors' questions, but often it's, it doesn't mean anything, just go. Once you explain the premise, you go. So like, cause when we did Salambo right after, we were back into the daring thing. We were crucified. <laughs> so, you know, well, so you got, also, got, yeah. And, little and unfortunate we slice got, and dice right. after getting a lot of accolades too that's part of right, it exactly exactly we got lulled into the accolades I, right then, exactly <laughs> just to, don't get too big for your britches exactly, exactly oh my god okay so 1987 no your partner the, the comp you're grieving he he 
passes, you're grieving, your partner, your love, the company is grieving, and you make a decision to step in as the artistic director. Was that an easy, obvious choice? Was that a difficult well, choice? Had, Charles did say I would be it. Oh, okay. So it, it was mentioned, so I have to say that. But there was a, almost a court intrigue. But Of course. But it, it didn't it didn't last that long. And the, the fact is that you know like when a congressperson dies and their spouse comes in to take it over, that's what it needed. And I don't think anyone else would have. And by this point I had gained some traction. I had some recognition. And um, I don't think it would have happened any other way. I, I just don't think so. And and we managed to keep it going for another 10 years. And I'm very proud of the work I did as artistic director there. And, but again, it was always, I used to say, it was running like hell to stay behind. And you, you, it was so painful to not be able to get your head. It was always worried about money all the time. So it was often the work, there was joylessness, not on stage, a, not in the work, but there was a- But in the a, struggle. In the struggle, yeah. In the struggle, and that mm -hmm. that you know that that that's a constant for any artist. It just, it it's remarkable how that is so pervasive in every aspect of art, and mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. not off the beaten track. Well, that's for another show. Uh, I want to get on to something ab about you. Um, okay, so s the social justice streak that was did, did you always have it uh, my guess is maybe it was clearly there or was it discovered by the confluence of the times that you grew up in the the of being gay of being and coming to grips with that of being a member of the ridiculous theater because you know was that that just as a part of all of the work that you seemed to have done i grew up in my parents, they, they would part, there was decency in my family, mm. but there was on, what is the word? Um, Jackie Kennedy said it about Queen Elizabeth. Un, there was a lack of curiosity and they were uncurious people. And so there was no, and, and my father was a rabid right-wing Republican and my mother was a lefty. So, and they were both dopes. So it, it didn't matter, <laughs> they were left and right of dope. But it was, uh, so I didn't know. And yeah, till you get older and you, you find your way. And then suddenly- and this whole social justice streak mm -hmm. emerged. It, but it came life. into me, it came in pretty early. It came, yeah. it's, uh, particularly around, I mean, I got here into the city. This is before I met Charles, was when Anita Bryant, started carrying on. Oh my Lord. And I remember time. going on that first march and I remember um, becoming aware of that. And then suddenly I'm in the midst of this, of uh, this gay culture demanding the equality. Equality, and, yeah. You know, and so I was, yeah, I was aware of it. And um, this is a perfect seg into, mm -hmm. into recovering racism. Recovering racism. That's my new. That's thing. your new thing. That's my... your new focus. Uh, so talk well, to me. What is it? William Kunstler once said that all white people are racist. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been thinking about that for years since he said it. And we are. I, I just want white people are victims of racism as well. White people in this country are victims of racism because it, racism is so inculcated into us from when we're little kids mm -hmm. that we grow up in it and you're buying the bullshit hook, line, and, line sinker. and sinker. So, and, and so like, there was a judge, like when I, I was, I remember being a teenager when the, when Martin Luther King was killed mm. and the, the turbulence in my neighborhood and we we're all afraid, but no one in my family 
like, especially they all, everyone in my family thought Malcolm X was a bad guy. Oh, same with my family. Right. So I didn't know this till later yeah. that Malcolm X was, in, in a sense, a freedom brilliant. for his people. And the brilliance, exactly. So we grow up in it. And then we have to learn to, white people need to learn to shake it off. And, and, and I don't think racism is the, because I'm, someone was just talking to me, a friend of mine, I forget her name, but there is no racism. We're only, we're one race of people. And, but what, what uh, W.E.B. Du Bois called negrophobic dehumanization. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to call it dehumanization. Oh, and, completely. And, and that's how work, they could, they, that's how they could have slaves. They could work, justify having exactly. slaves. Exactly. And we talked exactly. about who, the, the, we talked about the documentary, who put the Klan in Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan. And it was all of these oppressed uh, UK Scottish people that that went that lived in the South and and eventually became the oppressors because they right. when, they when wanted to make the money from somebody owning other human beings. Mm -hmm. And we've got to demand equality and this um, and and we've got to use like um, I guess um, what is the thing the the college course the races thing the big deal everyone the republicans are all up in arms about oh teaching teaching racism and 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 yes in and what's exactly. it called see, what's... see um oh dear lord oh yeah. have... i know it's a it's held the, the college thing. Mind. yeah it's and teaching um what actually happened racially and, right. and, and i think it's it, Oh, I don't know, but I, I'm not that smart. And but we need to to change. We've got to change, and it's well, got to change somewhere. And it's it's. But it but doesn't... okay. So we all have bias, and we all have, and we all know. Do those of us who are willing to make these changes and willing to admit that it, there's there is racism, and that we all have unseen bias in us, and we all do, white people do, benefit from the system that is completely set up to keep black people down. So Not just, the, it, it, it's all people of color are dehumanized in this yeah, country. All people of color, exactly. Black have gotten of course, word. it's, uh, it, gotten it's anyone that isn't perceived as right. white. It's ridiculous. Right. And it's so terrible. this is an interesting thing. I found, uh, I'm a recovering racist paper by James Holbrook and he, uh, he said, Oh. As one white commentator wrote, shedding racism is not like taking off a coat. It lies deep in the cells of the body, the detritus of the brain, the chambers of the heart, and the dark recesses of the soul. And, and I mean, you know. We, right, and it's taught to us from when we're children. And it's well, then so and, you go. Like we were told black girls had razor blades in their hair. And I'm thinking, what the fuck am I gonna do with razor blades in their fucking hair? It, it <laughs> you know, and so we well, learned- how, So how are we, how are we gonna, how do we wanna move this forward as people who feel strongly about this and people who want to use our art to do well, this? Well, it has to be in a place. It has to be in our plays. It has to be in our plays. It has to be in our plays. It has to be in our speaking out. And, but also we've got to pray about it. We must pray about it. We must ask God to come into this and eradicate it. It's, 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 because it's gone on too far here. It, it, it's, 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 it's. Well, it's fascinating that pe lots of people who pray to God do, do also keep this alive. And um, so well, anyway. Exactly, exactly. Um, so like we, it, we are, her. Time for another break. This is a fabulous conversation. Gene and Phillips, I want to talk there's about not enough time to kick all the ass. There is and not. And to talk about the character that you're creating that's gonna that is gonna deal with this issue. When we come back with Everett Quinton, stay tuned. Join us.
Join us every Tuesday at 4pm Eastern for the Mind Behind Leadership, where we focus on what leadership really means to us and to others. We have practical discussions with the CEOs of some of the world's largest companies, owners of small businesses, and experts in psychology and behavior to get that inside track, what to do, what to avoid, and what really happens. Join me, Graham Dobbin, at the new time, 4pm, every Tuesday for the Mind Behind Leadership, here live on talkradio.nyc. Hey everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy and Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. Calling all pet lovers. Pet Avengers, assemble! On the Professionals and Animal Lovers show, we believe the bond between animal lovers is incredibly strong. It mirrors that bond between pets and their owners. Through this program, we come together to learn, educate, and advocate. Join us live every Wednesday at 2 p.m. at talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Chipping around, keep my brain to the ground. These are the days it never rains. I remember doing that backstage during every show. We would stand backstage and do that to every word. An age of the- Oh my God, just like crazy people. Thank God. Thank God for you. Um, okay. Diving back into what we were talking about with Everett Quinton, um, critical race theory. Thank you very critical much. Critical race theory. That's oh funny. my God. Um, so, what are? We, let's talk about your next character that is related to your wanting to deal with this issue. My next character, who I've, I've already done her twice, is Auntie Fa. It's hi. I'm your Auntie Fa. Life's a banquet and these fascist motherfuckers are trying to starve us to death. You know what? I wish every fascist in the world would commit suicide. I, Light I stole the that. candles, I, get the, the edge, ice out. <laughs> on the edge of freedom, baby. No, no, I stole that joke from John Rivers one day when I was a kid. She said, I wish every roach in New York City would commit suicide. And that's where fascists, well, roaches are better than fascists. Roaches, roaches are just gorgeous little creatures. Fascists are pieces of. So, so Antifa. Of- how does Antifa relate to this? This so um, recovering. Well, racism. it's a sad world we live in, and the and racism began with the oligarchs. Racism in America began with oligarch slave owners who dehumanized this bunch of people who, when they were brought over, I read this great book, Religion in America, and the Africans who were brought here were not savages. They were not... Well, of course they were. They were... um, Developed humans with their own rich culture and understanding. Before before the Portuguese got to Africa, by, by comparison, Africa was first world. Africans had already figured out how to incinerate human waste and keep their, their their places fabulous. And then these bozos, illiterates from Portugal who just wanted their money came in. And then, so you get these people, they were not without culture. They were not without religion. They not. were not without things that move fabulous Soul people. Soul and spirit and understanding and, and then they brought depth. them here, They brought them here, stuck them in this, this servitude. And, Absolutely. And, 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 and even like the Muslims, when the Muslims enslaved Africans in the major minor and the Near East, they, when that the slaves converted to Islam by, because they were there, mm-hmm. the, Islam's had the Muslims had to free them 
Yeah. Because if in the Quran, you can't enslave yeah, a Muslim. Right. But in the Bible, you cannot enslave Christians. But what did the Christians do? They just reinterpreted it. They reinterpreted the book sure. and then continued the dehumanization of the people. To justify it. Okay. To enough. make money. For yeah, money. To, oh, totally. And you to cannot money. serve Capitalism. God. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. And, you know, I saw the speech that got Martin Luther King shot. I was watching the speech one day and I'm thinking, oh, that's what got him shot. Because Martin Luther King said, God will break the back of the arrogant nation. Yeah. And, 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 no. and the arrogant nation is... Oh. Yeah, I know. I know. I want us to get to Antifa. But Antifa and is, I want to... I want it known, I want it on my tombstone that I am an anti-fascist and I want it known. And my, my the goal of my life is to not let, well, anyone go unremembered, but the Nazis killed my gay brothers and sisters. Yeah, true. But nothing, 150,000 people, queer people were killed in the concentration camps. And the, when everyone else felt sorry for everyone else, no one felt sorry for the queers when they got out. The queers were still these dirty fucking queers who should have got what they got. And, and so my yeah. goal is to, uh, I want to die an anti-fascist. And, and what, like I, my first, not my first Antifa with neo-Nazis, what's new about it? What would would going to have self cleaning ovens? What 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 do neo Nazis do? Nazis are not going to get better. It's not going to get better. And the what what does Jesse Dollimore call them? The low information crowd. The low information crowd. Once what who said it? Who's the one who said they came for the Jews? I did nothing. nothing. They came for the so and so. I did nothing. They came for me, and there was nobody to help me. Yeah. Who's going to help you, low information boobs? Yeah. Who's going to help you? And and well, they, so, they they no one, and they 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 only. So. And I I want to write a play. I'm going to put in a play where this guy goes in a time machine, and goes back and stops Nathan Hale from going into that bar, and go in and say, Nathan, sweetie, they know you're going you're going to get caught, and then you're going to get killed, and then the Nazi motherfuckers are going to take over in 2022. So don't waste your time. Go back to Connecticut. Be a school teacher. Get a cute girlfriend oh and God. enjoy yourself. It's it's and all these things that we're taught is all rubbish. And then these morons that that like if I worked like you go to this Congress, I have never in my life every job, even the worst jobs, my colleagues were all kind of smart. Mm -hmm. Imagine being a congressperson and the people in that Congress are dumb as a bag of fucking hammers. And it's it's. Yeah. So what do we, where do you go? You have where nothing you but go? your voice. Where do you go? You have nothing exactly. but your voice. What's but, the, I was but, talking about, go ahead. You've got to be willing. I remember with homophobia, I was like afraid. I still am at times, but I think, oh, the, the, they're going to get me. They're going to get me. And then I realized the only thing you have to fear is dying. Yeah. All they can do is kill you. So fuck them. And it's the same with these fascist motherfuckers. Yeah, All we're they there. can do is kill you. We're there. And, and I hate fascists. You know, I hate, I hate, well, not you know, authoritarianism, Stalinism. Yeah. Um, yeah. All that stuff. Not just, the, I, I mean, I get the, I get the, the economic differences and the political differences, but it's all authoritarian and oh, totally. it's all the same. And and, and completely and, and based on capitalism and, and, and our climate change, it's all connected. It's and well, race, it's all well, connected. You look, at, look at South America and every fascist coup in yep. South America was instituted by the oil companies yeah, like i just I, I why did eisenhower go and befriend francisco franco in spain and why did eisenhower allow mozadek to be overthrown why because of oil and i mean if there's all this oil share the fucking money yeah like what's this what is it uh, the what is it gambia now they just found all this oil in Gambia. 
Yeah. And the fucking authoritarian leader of Gambia is living like a prince. His son drives, has like three cars that, and and the Gambians are starving. Okay, well, Feed we've got a break from people. that. We've got a break from that if you want Feed to. Feed those people. I, I'm with they're, you. Now, there I am. Now look at me. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and no, I got, want Antifa we on my gravestone. We're ending, so I, I want, want Antifa you to plug on my gravestone. Yes, and I want you to plug um, uh, your la the last yes. ELC good gifts. ELCA good gifts catalog. And I will tell you about it when we come back. No, we, oh, this, we, is, we, the this, this is, is the end. This is the end of oh. our show. Send your checks to Grace and St. Paul's Church, 123 West 71st Street, New York, New York, 10023. ELCA Good Gifts. We send goods and things to people less fortunate than ourselves, and it's our Advent project, and I'm pushing it. ELCA Good Gifts. <laughs> send your checks made out to Grace and St. Paul's Church, 123 West 71st Street, New York, New York, 10023. Anything, $5, $10. We can, you can get chick, we can get chickadees and you can buy mosquito nets for people that need mosquito nets. You can get water, water um, purification systems for people who need it. Fantastic. Send your checks. Oh, we got two minutes. Send, Send your checks made out to Grace and St. Paul's Church. Yes. One, and it will this two, will be in three, this will be in the notes. They will be able to one, see it. two, three, West 71st Street, New York, New York, one zero zero two three. I never have this opportunity to push this, but it's our advent, it's our advent appeal and buy someone a chicken. Yes. <laughs> Buy someone a chicken. Buy someone a chicken. Buy the go, my okay. little Okay. So, well, this was a glorious, me. glorious, passionate yeah. conversation. I want you to know that you can find Everett at everettquinton.net. The, there is a wonderful book on the theatrical life and times of Charles Ludlam in the ridiculous theatrical um, company by David Kaufman, if you're interested in, in further research on that genre slash company. Um, if you are interested in checking me out, go to sandrabargeman.com. And if you are interested in the CD, live CD recording of uh, The Edge of Every Day, you can find that at Amazon. You can also find it on Spotify and CD Baby. So now remember, folks, Next Monday, St. Paul's Church, one two three West Seventy First Street, New York, New York, one zero zero two three. And next Sunday, perfect. And next, and next Monday, and next Monday, seven p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and remember, you are always at the edge of the miraculous. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, my friend, for being Thank on my you. show. Thank I you, love man. your passion. Oh, we Grace and thank you. Under pressure. Under pressure. Under pressure.